Hello. Oh. Um, what your own sound like? Yeah. It's called Mike. Yeah. 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 Can you all hear me all right? Yeah. 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 Y
fully seven feet tall, entered the glade and said to him, Stranger, you have done me great dishonour. Why say you that, friend? I am no friend of yours, for you have paid me huge discourtesy. Oh, I'm sorry, Lord. Perhaps it is that I can repay you this. Perhaps me not addressing you by name and title is, is the faux pas that I have made. But not at all. For if it were that simple, we could redress it immediately. What you have done is graver still. Can't think of any affront I've caused, Lord. My hounds have been tracking this hind fully a year and a day, and when we finally caught it and brought it to ground, you shooed them off and fed your own dogs on it. There is no way to redress this insult. Paul says, Lord, if I'd known, I would never have cleared your hounds. I would have, I would have waited for them to feed and then requested part of the kill, as I am Lord of these lands. Ah, yes, I've heard of you. Paul of Daffod. So perhaps there is one way we could redress this balance. And what would that be, Lord? For I still don't know who you are, and I'm damned if I'm going to swear myself to a Lord I don't know. I am Arawan, Lord of Annan. Now for those of you that don't know in those times, Annan was the underworld, the fairy realm that's accessible down through the tiny glens and trees and nooks in the rock where people like Jez Hunt, if you've met him, frequent. All gnarled teeth, no hair, big beards and very bad tempers. I am Aran of Aran. I have a quarrel with a man in my land that I cannot settle. Perhaps, Lord, you would do me... In fact, speaking of the fairies that live in the ground... That. There. Exactly like that. Exactly like that. Hello, cats. Don't worry, I do know him. So perhaps you can settle a dispute for me. Hedery is a king of another realm of Annan. And we have disputes. And every year he meets me at the ford and we fight. And every year I strike him a killing blow. And he begs me for mercy to end it. And... My soul is disposed that I must do anything requested of me. So I give him a second blow to end his life. And every time he rises up again just as strong and fights me on the second day. I need someone to go to the ford in my stead a year and a day hence. And meet with her. And settle our dispute. Oh, I can do that gladly, Lord. But will he not realise it's me, not you? Ah, uh, fairy magics. Oh, fairy magics. I will put a charm on you and work your face so that you look as I do. And you will rule in my stead for a year and a day. And when the time is ready, you will take up arms, ride to the ford and fight in my stead. Fair enough. It's for that year and a day that I'm absent, who's going to rule my lands? My peasants are on the verge of revolt at any time. If I'm not there, what can I do? I'll come back and have no hall, no home, no gold, and certainly no mead, and I'm not having that. <laughs> what can I do? He said, no, no, by the same charm, I will take on your guys, and I will rule in your stead for a year and a day. And I think you will find this works out quite nicely for the both of us. Fair enough, says Paul. And Aran mounts his horse and says, follow me, and I will ride you to the gates of Anun, and show you my steading, where you must rule for a year and a day. Onto his horse, down to the tiniest brook bubbling out of a rock. There's no way my horse is going to fit into that. Oh, but it will. Magic. And the horse is shrunk tiny enough. You might recognise this from the Bible as well, actually. There's a cross out there. Tiny enough to pass through the eye of a needle. I believe it was camels in the Bible. Horses in this case. Through the eye of a needle and into the land of Anon into the fairy realm, at which point Aran stops and he says, further I cannot go, or the magic will not hold. There is my steading, there is my hall. Ride in, and you will be greeted as a lord. Very well, he thought. Rode down, and as he stepped off his horse, his groom came to meet him, delighted to see his lord return from the hunt, which was a bit strange for Paul, because he'd never seen the guy in his life. <laughs> Hello, mate. You all right? 
Yes, Lord. Never spoke to me before. Good. Went into the hall. Great rejoicing. A feast had been laid on for his return. He was handed a mug overflowing with mead. And a great boar was set roasting. This will do. He took his place at the head table, sat himself down, and began to eat. Every man coming and asking, How is your hunt, Lord? How is this? How is that? What are you planning to do about the new buildings, Lord, that you've been trying to put up for the last year and a half? You go, mm -hmm. We'll start on them tomorrow. Why, why not? I haven't got a clue what's going on. Might as well blag it. For a year and a day, Paul ruled in that land, and he ruled well and wisely. But not all was so comfortable in his life for Annan's wife. Aram's wife was beautiful, young, lithe, and for any man with vigour in his blood, this is a difficult combination to resist. But knowing that even though he was in the guise of Aram, he was not himself. And he was married at home, and he would commit no offence that could possibly be perceived afterwards. So for a year and a day, every night when they went to bed, he took himself to his side of his bed, wrapped himself in the blankets, and rolled to face the wall. Well, Aran's wife found this very strange, because her bedfellow normally spoke to her, cradled her in his arms, but she said nothing. She assumed something in the affairs of men was causing issue, and maybe it had passed. But for a year and a day, he ruled as wisely and as well as he could, he laid in that bed every night and resisted all temptation. He's a better man than me, I tell you. <laughs> don't worry, children, if you don't understand, ask your parents in the car on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> For a year and a day, Aran ruled in his stead in Daphith, in the palace at Nardus. When the time came, Paul rose from his bed. Squire, I still can't remember your name. Bring me my armour, for it is time to go to the ford and do battle, is it not? Yes, Lord, it is. And he brought out bright, shining armour and laid it on him. The great cuirass, the pauldrons, the gauntlets. Finally, the bright, shining blade and his huge, rounded shield of linden. He mounted his horse, and he rode down to the ford, and there, Hebert was on the other side, sat astride his horse, resplendent in his armour, huge shield, mighty war spear in his hand. Oops. Oh, Paul might have misjudged this one slightly. Bring me a bigger sword, squire. Ha! Bigger sword, bigger shield, much better. He waded out until he was fully knee-deep in the ford. And Hebert did the same, standing face to face over the rocky bed. Paul struck the first blow and with a mighty clash the shield exploded into splinters and the blade bit deep into his neck. Blood flowed crimson, ran out and filled the waters, turning the whole river to a broiling dark red. Heveth on his knees looked at the Lord and said, what offence have I caused you? I rule in my own kingdom rightly. Why would you bring this upon me? My lord, it hurts me to my soul. I beg of you, end this. Strike for one more blow. No chance, says Paul. I know about this. For if I lend you another blow, you will rise up equally strong tomorrow and fight me again. I've learnt this over the years. No, I will not strike you another blow. But any other man here can end this if he so wishes. No? Die. Into the river you fall. Heveth then said, Carry me away, my liege men. Take me back to my hall, for my end is upon me, and I would be amongst my family. At that moment, Paul's attendees, thinking him to be Aran, said, Lord, now you are the king of all of Annan. Surely every man that followed Heather should swear allegiance to you. That's probably a good point. 
but I am a fair man. I will allow leniency. Any man that bends knee now from heaven's assistants, associates, hall, family, blood, warriors, I will bring them into my fold, and you will be loyal men to me. Any man that resists, I will put to the sword, and you will bleed beside your lord into this river. Needless to say, no man there was stupid enough to argue. They all bent knee, and over the whole land, Pulk then took ownership. Well, a year and a day had passed. He knew the magic was fading. He rode back to the head of that tiny stream. The horse extended back into the real world, and standing there waiting to meet him was his own image. Like looking into a mirror, only not. And then with the melting of magic, the face changed, and there stood before him, fully seven feet tall, was around. Is it done? Yes, Lord, it's done. Am I king of all Anon? Yes, Lord, you are. So, how is my kingdom, Lord? How stands Stafford? How is Naboth? So I think you will find I have ruled well and wisely. Paul rode home, entering the hall, overjoyed to see his men after a year and a day, but of course he'd been there all along. So they couldn't understand his exuberance to see him on this evening. They'd laid on no feast. Paul was mildly put out by this and felt it was time to call his trusted men, his wife and her attendants to him and say, here's the deal. In the last year and a day, have you noticed a difference in my rule? Truly, Lord, you have never ruled more wisely. You have never ruled more fairly. You have never been more just and honest a man than you have for the last year and a day. Ah. Sure. At the same time, in Annan, the same conversation was being had between Aran and his men. Truly, Lord, you ruled wisely and fairly, and do not take it from us. This is the best rule. Don't change it. Don't change. Hmm. Well, I should tell you what has passed in the last year and a day. And Aran related the tale to his men, much as I have to you. Much as Polk is to his family at this very moment. We return to Narbeth. He says, so what would you have me do? Would you have me rule as I was? Or would you have me rule as it is today? Oh Lord, the rule that Aram brought us was fair and just. If you have learned anything from him, you have a true and noble friend in the other lands. Rule as you did there, and so shall it be here. And happiness descended onto their house. This tale is not yet done. Because in Aran, in Anan, sorry, <laughs> in Anan, in Aran's house, his wife then said, ah, knew something was up, <laughs> knew something was wrong. You're only devil, not, not just you, sir, you just happen to be stood there. You're only devil. <laughs> I knew something was up for the last year and a day, every time we have taken to bed, you wrap yourself in blankets and laid to the wall. Should have known, should have known. Around soul sank for the year and a day that he'd been living in now there. <laughs> That was a different story. He said, ah, oh, truer a friend have I never had than I find in Pulk of Daphis. From this day forth, let it be known throughout this land and the next that he is now Pulk, son and prince of Annan. And if ever there is issue, we will rise up in our fairy host and ride out to defend him, and I'm sure he will find us equally measured. This is the first chapter of the Mabinogion, and here is an end to it. However, the Mabinogion is in three branches, and the first branch has about nine chapters. I don't have time to tell you the full first branch, or we'll be here until the sun goes down. <coughs> but we return to Narda, to Polk, and his wife has died. It's some time later. Sad times. Polk being a red-blooded man, but true to his oaths, we know he was tempted more than once when he spent his time in Annan. He found himself without a wife, 
he found himself without child, and in those days, not having a child, you three would be, uh, four, would be absolutely useless in this Because in those days, girls, yeah, you marry them off for three pigs and an acre of land. Depends how pretty they are. Three pigs and an acre of land, or maybe a castle if they're very pretty, you know. But sons, sons were the line. Because in this day and age, it is a patriarchal society we find ourselves in, in darkest Wales. Now I think it's sheep reality, but we won't go there. <laughs> he had no sons. He had no wife. What's a man to do? He went hunting. Now I'm not sure entirely what kind of hunt he set out on, but he did take his dogs and his horses and he rode out and they passed a mound off the road. And he said to one of his retainers, what is this mound here? I've never seen it before. So said, Lord, that is Gorsest Arbor. That's the burial mound of some of great ancestor unknown to us. Hmm. I bet there's a cracking view from the top of that. Oh, my Lord, there is. But any man that rides to the top of Gorsest Arbor and sits there will either see something beautiful or suffer many blows. Paul looks about him, armoured as he is for the hunt, looks at his retainers and his men, he goes, with you beside me, I have no fear. <laughs> I won't suffer blows, but I would gladly see something marvellous. Let us climb that hill. Let's go and sit on the top, we'll see what we see. Up they went, dismounted the horses, laid back, right. Ah. Time passed. No blows, no miraculous vision. More time passed. No blows, no miraculous... Ah, ah, ah. Riding along the same road came a fair-haired maiden on a milk-white mare, riding by. Result? <laughs> it's full. Squire, go and see who that lady is, because I've never seen her before in my life, but I would much greatly like to get to know her better. If you catch my drink. <laughs> Squire rides down. The lady carries on on her horse at a gentle walk. The squire sets spur to steed and can't draw any faster, regardless of how fast his horse rides. The lady carries her gentle pace and pulls the distance until she fades away into the gathering dusk. Squire, what the hell was that? <laughs> Says Paul. Could you not have ridden any faster? He said, my lord, I rode the horse half to death, and yet I could draw no closer. All I could see was the tail disappearing into the distance. Mm. Right, let's go back to Narbeth and have a feast. There was a lot of feasting in the Mabinogion, obviously. They always do it. Let's go back to Narbeth and have a feast. They rode back. They brought out the boars. They brought out the mead. The minstrels were called in. The bards and the poets and the Scots were brought in from all around. Next morning. Uh, Maybe we shouldn't have had a feast, lads. <laughs> <laughs> Who was with me at Gorset Arbor yesterday? All the men. Oh, I was, Lord. God, please don't ask us to go back there. It's very sunny outside. <laughs> We're going back. Okay, Lord. Right, five minutes, we'll be ready. They rode out, back to Gorset Arbor, sat on the hill. Time passed. The lady came riding by once more. He went, right. No squire this time, I will send one of my knights. Down the hill, find out who that lady is. Same thing, no matter how fast the horse rode, he could draw no closer to that tail disappearing into the distance of the lady's horse. Tell you what lads, let's go back to Narberth. You can guess what's coming next, what did they do? Not you. Oh, do you not understand the theory of point and feet? Oh, what did they do? Well done, you've been paying attention. Ah, there we go, they, they had a feast. <laughs> yes, next morning, same thing. Too much mead, too much meat. Oh, God, why do we keep having these feasts? It's a bad idea. Oh. <laughs> Who was with me at Gorsis Arbor? Oh, for God's sake. Oh. <laughs> Get back on your horse. Really? <laughs> Squire, come here. Saddle for me our best steed, and I will put our finest rider upon it. They got the Gorsis Arbor, sat down, lady appeared. Off you go, lad jumped on the fastest horse, set spur to skin, rode it half to death. The sweat was slathered underneath the tack, it was chomping at the bit, its eyes wild. The rider himself, slightly sore. <laughs> <laughs> there was nothing he could do. He came back a broken man to my lord. 
There is not a man in this world that can catch up with that. Well, I won't tell you what. <laughs> There is not a man in this world that can catch up with that horse. All I could see was the tail receding into the distance. Which is possibly where we get the English saying of chasing tail from. But, uh, <laughs> all I could see was his tail receding into the distance, Lord. Yeah, right, let's go back to Narbeth. Let's have another feast. <laughs> I don't know where they got all these wild boars from, because they're hellishly difficult to catch. At the end of the time. <laughs> let's have another feast the next morning. Right. Back to Gorsuch's harvest, everybody. This time, I'll go. You lot, useless, all of you. Me, I'll ride out. I will find out who this lady is. Sat on Gorsuch's harvest. Down came the lady on the road. Marvellous, he thought, right? Jumped on the horse, set his spurs in, and galloped as hard as he could, and still could draw no closer. As the steed began to fail, stumbling and snorting, he called out, Lady, for the sake of the one you love the most, will you not stop and tell me your purpose? As ladies often do in this situation, she turned around smiling smugly and said, It would have been better for your men and your horses had you but asked that the first time. <laughs> Gladly I will stop. She said, Lady, I have never seen a more beautiful woman than you but I must know what you're doing in my lands. Who said, my name is Rhiannon. I am son of Het, her daughter even, of Hefe Klau, lord in the next country. And I have come to seek out my husband. Lady, tell me why you seek your husband and what is his name? I've been promised to another man in my lands, but he is harsh, twisted, bitter, fat and ugly. And I don't fancy that much. I have come here looking for Polk of David. Have you seen him? Ah, oh, lady, this is the greatest news that have come to my ears in many, many times. This is the best news I've had all year. For I am Polk of David. Also, son and prince of Annan, you may have heard. Eh? Eh? Ah, she says, in that case, it is you I have come to seek and to ask if you will take my hand in marriage. Lady, gladly I will, for if there was another woman in this world that I could choose, and I have been to the fairy realm, and they are all smoking. <laughs> if I could choose any woman in this world or the next, I would pick you. When shall we set the date? She said, you must come to Hebechbao's hall. Oh, immediately, no, 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 no. Because, as we all know, ladies like to take their time. You must come to the hall in a year and a day, and we will be married. Gladly, my heart awaits it with much joy. In a year and a day, I will see you at your father's hall. He rode back to Gorsa's Arbor. But whenever a man questioned him on what had been said between him and the lady, he answered no more than, wait a year and a day, and you shall find out. Good folk, if you want to hear the end of this story, you don't have to wait a year and a day, you only have to wait a year. <laughs> because I will tell the rest of the second branch of the Mabinogion in this tent at Pagan Pride 2015, if they'll have me back. I'll be in one of the speakers' forums, I think it's Forum 1, and telling the first story recorded in our language, the greatest story, Beowulf, in its entirety. It will take an hour. You might want to try and buy a cushion or a blanket from some of the traders <laughs> to sit on, because they haven't got these lovely blow-up chairs. They've got a ground sheet. It's all very nice. You've done a lovely job. But if you find yourselves at a loose end, it's 4 o'clock. Come along and have another listen. You've been fantastic. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>